There you go. Okay, so uh, the idea for this afternoon is to really do some hands-on modeling and run a model and discuss some ideas of that. And that's also kind of as a background for the rest of the week to, to understand how a model works and how parameter work. Uh, when you, tomorrow, during the hands-on, you're looking at parameter uncertainty, parameter and quantifying that with a somewhat simpler model, but still kind of similar type of model approach. Um, the model we were using, of course, because I'm, I'm using a, it's a HPV model, and in the ver it's in the version, so-called version HPV Lite. Um, HPV, this version came about when I did my, during the time I did my PhD, I was also teaching a, a several courses. And I found it well, frustrating with the software which was available at the time. Uh, I spent an hour or so explaining how to do everything and uh, it was not very intuitive, clear how to, to use this software. There's also several steps and for plotting. So it was not at all user friendly. SMHI had developed, or oh, that was the version from SMHI at that time. Uh, they had developed their software mainly as a, a service to the hydropower industry. That a lot of funding to develop the HV model and to implement the software came from hydropower, a lot of interest. And they have, of course, very different needs from, from, a, uh, from teaching or using the model as a research tool. So that's why I kind of developed a simplified model, uh, or, or simplified user interface, basically. The model, the core model is still, was still the same, but the user interface was, was much simpler. And this kind of, having a simpler user interface, that was one colleague then, uh, kind, of, kind of more as a joke, said, well, yeah, you should call it HPV Lite, because it's the uh, easier use inter uh, user interface. Um, for some stupid reason, I used this term, <laughs> and I told it in my first publications, and then I got stuck with that. Uh, I got a lot of times question now of people, oh, I've been using HPV Lite, and actually could I get the real version? Uh, and it's really not, it's a Lite version, it's a software that's, uh, so it's a, there is, at least from us, there's no other version. Um, as I told you before, there are different versions. So this is the SMHI version at the time, there are now different other versions. Oftentimes, HPV is implemented in different kind of small handmade programs in Python or uh, as a, yeah, uh, I can even have as an Excel version, there is R, R version. So people are often doing, working on often programming them, them, them own, on their own. Um, the uh, crucial fact part that takes a lot of time to develop is not necessarily the code itself, but the things that are sort of around it. Um, what we, some kind of features which we have included in HPV Lite and for why it probably HPV Lite is a somewhat, by, the, by now, a somewhat misleading term because we included features which you would not find in most of the other HPV model implementations. So in some way, in a lot of ways, it's more, actually more advanced or more, has more, more powerful and more, has more functionality than other versions. Um, what we had early on was the possibility to easily run Monte Carlo uh, runs, so basically, which means that you run the model with random parameter sets, you, you uh, run the model, you save how good it is, uh, and then do the next one. And that, that way, allowing for doing millions of model runs um, uh, in a very easy, easy way, and you can select which ones to save, so you might choose to only save the very best parameter values. Um, similarly, you can do batch runs, so you can prepare uh, parameter files and generate like large files, and then the model would read one, one line after the other and do the model runs with different parameter sets. Uh, we then implemented a genetic algorithm for optimization, so an automated way to, to calibrate the model. Uh, since we're doing a manual calibration later on, I should not have told you that. Uh, Please don't cheat. Uh, previously, I had a teach uh, education version where I had this genetic algorithm disabled. Um, now, usually, 
I leave it like that, uh, but trust on that the students won't cheat. Um, we implemented, we found it kind of important in some several research projects to look on different, diff, uh, to evaluate different parts of the model. So we added new objective functions, both for runoff, diff, to look in different aspects of runoff. But we also included objective functions to allow to include snow data or groundwater data. So groundwater levels to, to calibrate the model uh, both at two groundwater and stream levels, or stream, stream flow, uh, but also for snow coverage or snow water equivalent time series. And then a certain, you can choose uh, in the setup of different modifications of the model structure and some different choices. Uh, more recently, added uh, the ability to calculate subcatchments. So before we had just one lumped uh, way with different elevation zones. Now we, uh, it's possible to set up catchment with different subcatchments. Um, and we also added, uh, uh, besides the graphical user interface, we added a command line version, which allows to run HBA the software based uh, out of R or MATLAB, which makes it much easier to run different settings, do something with the results, run it again. And a lot of the studies I showed earlier today with the 600 catchments, of course, it's only possible if you have this command line version, because you don't want to sit 600 times and click and do things. The user interface is very nice for for teaching purposes and for doing exploring uh, new catchments, but it's once you're in a more operational mode with, and want to run a lot of catchments, you have to have some kind of way to run to run it automatic. And just as one example, is how the routines are beyond now beyond the standard versions. Actually, we included a new glacier routine, uh, so for for uh, glaciers, which is, uh, also allows for glaciers to shrink. Uh, which turned out to be quite important, of course, since I moved from Sweden to Switzerland. Switzerland has a lot of catching with glaciers, so it was important to add that functionality. And that is some uh, very recent development in the model. Uh, quickly, just, uh, we won't probably use it today, but just as an information background, how the, this algorithmic algorithm works. Um, so say, so, so for those of you, you know, some of you are also teaching, this genetic algorithm is very thankful for, for teaching, for explaining how model, automatic model calibration works. So basically the idea of this algorithm is that we mimic the Darwin survival for the fittest. So what we do is we start with a, some population of parameter sets. So each of these strings represents one parameter set. So certain parameter for threshold temperature, a certain per degree day factor for the FC and for all of the different parameters. We have these populations. We run the model for each of those. We then rank the, the parameter sets according to the performance. Um, so from the best to the worst. And then we, we generate offsprings. And that we do by, by calculating two, we randomly select two parameter sets here and combine them. And the combination goes by taking either uh, one of the two values or taking a value in between randomly. So the different rules how, how a new set is generated. And then we have next generation and we iteratively go, this, go, uh, go from generation to generation. And now the Darwin aspect comes in that, that we, the best parameter sets, so we, those which are see, ranked highest in terms of model performance, they are selected more often than the others. So again, kind of very simple as Darwin, the survival for the fittest, who is kind of the animal that is most adapted, gets most offsprings. Here in this, in this way, the model parameter, the parameter set that is best gets most offsprings. And that, and that uh, algorithm works surprisingly well for optimization. Uh, it also has the advantage that, that it's allows us to do a lot of calibration trials. And so if you want to quantify parameter uncertainty, you can do that by Monte Carlo runs, so doing a lot of runs and then only select the very best. Or uh, you can do that by calibrating it, uh, the model, several times. And then if you have parameter uncertainty, you will end up at different places in your parameter space. 
oftentimes it's a similar good fit, but it might have very different parameter sets. So that's a, as a way, uh, as a way of quantifying parameter uncertainties. So that's just about this feature, which we always won't dive in today. Um, personally, I, of course, find hydrological modeling a lot of fun. I find exercises a lot of fun. Um, being at a geography department, I, uh, some of my students don't like modeling as much as I do. So we spend some time to think of what can, how can we best transfer the knowledge and how can we engage students. So the kind of teaching goals which we kind of always have for our teaching is we want to, there's this very concrete knowledge about the model, about this specific model. But then it should be go beyond that. It should also be how to apply a model to a specific problem, uh, to un understand how a model works, and also seeing the model limitations. And oftentimes, pro uh, working with a model, the students get more aware of also of the this, of the limitations. So, but the, as a result, we have this progression of of exercises, which are here now for the HPV model, but basically could similar well for work for other models. Where we start with very, a very simple calibration or, uh, task, and then things get, get more and more abstract and more and more advanced and end up. So, in the end, more advanced uh, exercises are then to program a snow routine on their own. It's an exercise we are often doing in, in classes uh, in order to make sure that one really understands how a model works. Or if, even more advanced, of, yeah talking about interception routine, which we talked earlier about, uh, asking students to come up with their own solution, how would they formalize things. But uh, kind of the more HVD based are the first five exercises here where they really use, uh, really use the software. Um, we have here kind of different exercises and uh, I would like to combine kind of today kind of do the HVB land exercise, but then add on as a little bit of an exercise the this design flood. Um, the design flood is not very important because of really important the HV model because it was also one of the reasons the HV model was has been developed. Um, so the, the is is always this need for hydrologists to say something about the highest possible flows. And you can do this, use different statistical methods. They can be easily criticized for several reasons, mainly because you're extrapolating the distribution functions far beyond what the data tells you. So the alternative approach with using a model like the HV model is to uh, calibrate your hydrological model and then create a kind of worst case scenario. So add uh, a, uh, a lot of snow uh, accumulation, a quick temperature rise, and a lot of rain. And then you put this, this rain series into the model and uh, simulate then this, the flow that originates. And so what I want to do with you today is that you, you get the task to calibrate the model for HVV land. And then in the end, we'll do a simplified version of this design flood. So instead of doing, putting a longer rainfall sequence, you put a rainfall signal of 100 millimeters or, or, uh, at different points in the data and start to see how, how much of an influence, it, how, how big of a flow you would get. Um, okay. So did everyone manage to get download the software? Right, reasonably well, good. Um, the room is not fully ideal for doing computer work, uh, so having that on knees. And also, I, usually I go like to go through and look on, uh, discuss things. So if you could leave a few rows empty so that people, <laughs> kind of for passing, that would be good. So uh, that I can. Otherwise, it's people sitting in the center are really difficult to approach and to see what you're doing. So if you can distribute yourself a little bit and make sure that one can a little bit walkable. Um. Yeah. Uh, you might have mentioned this before, but is it available for Mac? Or 
personally, Windows software. Very sorry. Uh, unfortunately, at some point, in hindsight, I'm very unfortunately, we made the decision to go for, for Coconut and Visual Basic, which is only available for Windows. Uh, that allowed us to make this nice user interface, but only for Windows. So, uh, I hope you know, not too many of you have a Mac. Uh, there is a pro the possibility to run it somehow with an emulator. Um, but for today, I would just kind of, it's also good, we can work in pairs, so if you go. So, um, trying to kind of introduce a model here on the screen. Um, so, so if you, when you start it, start the software, you should see something like that. Is that what you got? Yes. It, yeah. It's good. Nogging or something. Uh, anyone having problem getting a starting? Uh, the, and then you, if you already have one attachment, it will show up on, uh, in the box there. Um, but if you haven't done, then you go for browse for catchment, click on OK, and then you go wherever you have saved your data. So in this case, I have it somewhere. Yeah. So uh, put it here. I have the data here on this location. Important part here is you have to locate yourself on the uh, on the directory which says HPB there, not on the on the directory below it. So in the in your cat, each cat, uh, catchment you have set up, you have data for HPB, it's organized that you have this the directory for the catchment, the catchment name, and under that you have a data, which is the input data, and the results, which is the output data. But you have to locate yourself at this point of HPV land here. Then you press OK. And then you, you have this button on the, down there, which, which says run, and then you can, there you can run the model. On the left, you have a list of all the model parameters, so sorted by different, diff, different routines. So it starts with the uh, snow routine parameters, uh, then it, the soil routine parameters and uh, further down the response routine parameters. And every time you change, you have to click on this run button again. What you see here in the, uh, in the larger part here, uh, quickly running through the different things you can see here. So by default, we always plot one year of data which is usually quite a good amount, so where you see enough of data to, to see something, but still it's detailed enough so that you see the individual one-off events. But you can change the display amount uh, up here. You can choose a different date, uh, so make that shorter and plot only a month, or make it larger and plot several years at a time. Um, then from below we see here down here we see the runoff. Blue line is a uh, the observed runoff, and red line is a simulated runoff. So by changing our model parameters, we change the red line. So it, we change the simulations. Uh, then we have the blue and um, blue line is observation. Here in the middle we have the blue bars and the blue bars, that is the observed rainfall. And then we have the green line, and the green line is a simulated snow water equivalent. 
So an HPV model, again, we always talk about snow just as water equivalent. So not real snow, snow depths, but how much water is in the snow. Um, and then up here in the high upper part, the red line, which is going up and down here, is the observed temperature. The black line is the accumulated difference between observations and simulations. So you see this part here where we, for a certain time, underestimate the stream flow, so then it goes up, and then we overestimate it and it goes down. And you see if this is slightly going down here, that means we always overestimate stream flow a little bit. If it's going up, we underestimate it. Systematic errors. Yeah. Is the accumulated difference between what? Uh, good, uh, accumulated difference between observed and simulated runoff. Runoff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. for, so for runoff, and that helps to identify whether there's a small timing issue, then it goes up and down, or as a constant error, then it goes all the time up. Good. Um, by default, it's the scales are chosen so to see most of for that particular time period. That sometimes can make a dip, uh, the comparison between different time periods be difficult because it's, the windows will always be rescaled. So if you look up here in previous and well, previous and next, well, this here, you can screen, you can go through the hydrograph for different years. Uh, but as I just said, the uh, kind of it's always scaled so that it fits the entire hydrograph. So, uh, so it always looks kind of flat. Uh, events look of similar size, but if you check, care check carefully, the, the axis is changing. If you want to better compare from year to year, you have to click up here where it says same, min, and max for each period. So this is. This small box up here. And if you do that, then you can browse through the different years and it, you can, it's easier to compare the different sizes. So, this, for instance, this year is a year where there was no really high, bit larger event. So, this is really small. If you want to see something, some detail in that year, you have to click, take that away, and then suddenly it looks again like a lot of. You see the details. If you want to compare it with other years, you have to choose this button. Um, so let's go to a more interesting year again. So, um, this is the main plot you will be looking at, but sometimes it's also good to look at the internal model storage. So how much water is in the soil storage, how much in the groundwater. For that, you can choose the different plot options up here. So we're up here, where it says soil plus E plus Q, so soil. That gives you the soil moisture status. So here it's pretty filled during winter, then it's, end, it's drying up during the summertime, and then refilled again. Uh, and down here in the middle, you have the evaporation. In green, the potential evaporation, and in brown, the actual evaporation. So, in the beginning of the spring, actual evaporation is the same as the potential, but then in this case here now, during summertime, it's much more limited because as the soil, as the soil box gets drier, uh, uh, the actual evaporation is, is limited. And finally, you can plot, choose up here the groundwater plus Q plot, uh, where it now gives you the water levels in the upper and in the lower groundwater box. So here, uh, the blue here is the upper box, the lower is the, uh, box is the black line. And you see the difference between these two water, uh, groundwater stores, uh, which depend, of course, on the parameter values you choose, but in the typical parameterization, it says, Lower box is this small, slow changes going up and down and kind of feeding the stream flow, the having the space flow. Whereas the upper box all only fills during times of extended rainfall, then it fills and then it can go completely dry again and then fill again. Um, 
it's good to look at these ground water stores. For instance, if you want to change something like the, the look on the influence of the different outflows. So with the threshold value for the upper box now being this, before the upper outflow from the upper box becomes active, this U setter L, this is this 30 here. That means if I go here and look on 30, that means that only during this one event, so during this event, the upper outflow is really active. Mm -hmm. And that helps you to identify when to look, expe uh, expect any changes. I've had cases where people were changing the K0 value like crazy and they were surprised that there was no change, but that simply was because the water level in the upper box never reached the threshold value. So they, that in that case, the K0 value had no, had no, uh, no effect. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the basic here. So now, um, this is HPV land, the data we're looking at. HPV land is this fantastic catchment which exactly behaves like HPV. So usually we are all aware we never have perfect data and we never will get a model, of, model fit of a perfect model fit. But luckily we found this catchment, HPV land, where it's possible to get a perfect model fit. Uh, so now your task is to get that perfect model fit. Uh, at the moment, the fit doesn't look so very good, uh, and we can kind of go look, start together, think what needs to be changed. As a general rule in this type of uh, snow uh, influence catchments, it's usually good to get the spring flood right in time and right in amount. And before then going to the soil palm, we just get the water balance right, and then work on the groundwater routine to get the timing correct and the dynamics. Uh, of course, that often has to go in iterations. But the first start often is good to start with the snow uh, parameters. So looking at the hydrograph here, is there any, what would you change in the parameters? How to get a better fit? This threshold temperature. Threshold temperature, okay, good. How would you change it? It's now zero. What do you want to have? Minus two. Minus two, okay. I like that, so that is really the spirit. Uh, you should, in general, make, at least, especially in the beginning, make drastic changes so that things really change. In the end, you might more need more tiny changes and sometimes less, but uh, often it's good to make a good drastic change. So minus two now. Uh, what do you expect with that to happen? What, why would you? Um, it was better. <laughs> It is better, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, what, what chain? Uh, what, so, how was your reasoning? Uh, the snow would melt uh, earlier. Yeah, okay. So, we will, uh, we will have this time. Okay, so, should we check? So, as you see now, you, ch you change the parameter. So, now this box down here is red. That means the parameter has been changed and, and the model has not been run yet. So, you click on that, you run it. Wow. Oh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so that looks much better now. So this threshold temperature, is a, uh, as you were saying, is lower value. That means the temperature is early, uh, snow starts melting earlier. So you move the in time. Uh, so in a similar way, but so now the model is much better. It looks much better now. Still, the model efficiency, which you have up here in the corner, probably can't read it here, but you can read it on your own computer. At the moment, it's 0.2489, so which is really low. Uh, should be possible to get a one here. Then you have the mean difference in millimeters per year. Uh, so that should, of course, be zero, at, uh, if possible. Uh, and in this case of HPV land, it actually is possible. So there's still a lot of time, uh, room for improvement. Um, any other suggestion? What would change? Should we change? Oh. Hmm? 
Good. I, I, yeah. Do you, oh, let's see whether we, are we, do we think it's perfect with the snow? Let's, it's always good to go look at a few different, um, different years with different amount uh, dynamics. So if I, oh no, my God. So if you look here, or also doing this event here, this large event, in general, do we have the right amount of snow? Too much, yeah, okay. So and that seems to be consistent all the time. So what would you do, how would you do less? Temperature, which will increase, decrease a bit. Uh, evaporating, yeah. But evapor so evaporation of snow, that is a snowfall correction factor, which kind of implicitly lets uh, remove snow. So should that, the snowfall correction factor, should that be, it's probably no, what is it? It's one. Um, should that become larger or smaller? Small. Smaller, okay. Do you have any suggestion on, do you want to drastic values or what would you do? 0 0.5, okay. So 0 0.5, which means so half, whenever precipitation simulated to be snow, it's, we take 50% away. Um, and if we run the model again, yeah, well, yeah, the efficiency became worse. The amounts here, oh, look a little bit, maybe data. Maybe it was a little bit too drastic. Uh, so maybe something in between. Um, I suggest now kind of how you get to try on your own. Uh, it's always good to discuss this thing. So if you, you know, work on the same computer or work on two different computers, but discuss with your neighbor uh, what, what you're changing, what you expect the change to, inf to make. Um, so reasoning a little bit by, by that. Uh, again, as a small anecdote, an uh, when I started this, it still took a few seconds uh, for the students to, before the run was done. So the students took thought to put some thought into it. Now with this immediately being simulated, it's almost, it gets very fast and sometimes I, almost thinking of building in a small thing that makes it slower, just to put more th thinking into it. So the idea of this exercise is really not that you put in a lot of numbers quickly, but you should think of why you do a certain change. So think that, that it would be a kind of the simulation takes some time and you have to think carefully what you change and what you expect it to be, not just quickly one minute. Yeah. Uh, you had a question? No, oh, I had a suggestion which parameter Okay, what would you like to change? Capacity. Yeah, make it. Probably uh, 300. So you won't have that larger. So we can do that. So what do you expect then? What should happen? The runoff will be... The runoff go up or the runoff go down? Down. 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 Yes. Oh. Okay, yeah, so uh, somewhat had an effect on the mean difference, so you are a little bit down, but probably you still need to reduce it more. Good, um, yeah, I'll... Um, yeah, so just you start working on your own and kind of try to re be the first one to reach a model efficiency of one or first. Um, can, can you uh, distribute the email right away? Do uh, you have a list? So that we, I can, because uh, I could send the, uh, the slides in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah.
Maybe for later. No. Uh, I think also not, not, uh, if if the, if you want to look at the uh, at the slides while uh, because then you have some model description there. There's also uh, if you want to look at I can just do, there's this help function here which uh, uh, which explains some of the parameters. So you have have a, the help. It's a, there's no manual, but there's a help function. But it will distribute the slides from this morning. Uh, I'm very impressed by the performances here. So there are several which are above 9.95, some 9.76, which is one of the best manual calibration I've ever seen in this exercise. So, uh, Sergey, you're the winner of today. <laughs> Thank you. No, there is 9.8. No? Nine, oh, yes, 9.8. Who is that? <laughs> to you? Well, I don't have any good prize, but I can give you the crowd for the pen as a prize. Of course, it comes with the Hopefully, you will now install the crowd for the app. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So the, it's interesting to see the kind of, if you look on the special, uh, it's more here, but you can all see it on your, on your notebook. Um, the variation of parameter values. Uh, so uh, for instance, the uh, winning, oh, jumping here. Um, oh, uh, you had here uh, FC of 230. Uh, someone else had here 610. Still, the model efficiency in the end there's some difference, but it's not it's not totally off. So you see that it's even for the simple, totally error-free case of HPV land, there is some kind of parameter equivalency that you with different approaches, different. Uh, uh, parameter sets, different combinations, you can get similar results. Um, and that's kind of, it's an, of course, even more the case if you have real data. So if you have a, a catch, real catchment data where you won't achieve a perfect fit but get something close, um, then you can uh, see even more that the uh, uh, parameters differ. And that's again for kind of uh, if you teach a modeling class, exercise like this uh, can be very, very, very good, good demonstration of parameter uncertainties. Uh, because then, and it's, it's not a full scale Monte Carlo analysis, but basically it's the, uh, the student based Monte Carlo analysis where you calibrate in different ways. Um, for those who have not achieve the very best results, oftentimes what happens, in, that happens even for HPV land here, that you calibrate and at some point by changing one parameter, regardless how you change it, it will just get worse. So in that time, uh, that means you've kind of probably reached some local optimum and which might not be the, the past might not be go, continue. So in that way you have to change, it, would have to change a lot of things to kind of start, almost start from scratch and then you could try again. Um, are there any questions to HPV land? Yeah. Or? Uh, could you please tell us several words about input trials? How are they to be organized and... Uh... Okay, good. Uh, quickly about the input files which you now have, now they're all prepared. Um, so quickly that, before I tell you the real values. The input files which you have, um, uh, basically, uh, um, the most important is the PTQ file, um, which is, stands for precipitation, temperature, and runoff. And uh, there's this time, different columns of state, uh, precipitation, temperature, and runoff. Runoff always in millimeter per time step. Uh, you can run HV all now it's a daily time step, but you can run different time steps, but it's always a unit of always millimeter per time step. Uh, then you need the evap operation time uh, file, and there you have different options. This 12 values is the easiest. You can have 365 values, which is on the whole annual, 
or you can have as many values as your PTQ file is long, and then you have a different potential operation for each time step. Uh, and the model will automatically do the proper thing then. Um, that's the two. Then, uh, well, then is a, another file which is called tmean, which is a uh, mean temperature uh, seasonality, which is used to calculate the temperature anomalies. The, uh, there's one more file in the data file, which is called Claria, which is catchment data. That is automatically generated uh, that's from inside the model. Uh, you can generate that as an XML file, you can generate it on your own, but it's more difficult, so therefore we have the user interface to help with that. So all these XML files, uh, they are generated by... Yeah, yeah. So basically, if you look in the, in the directory, with the data directory, mm -hmm. the TXT files are generated by you in some kind of outside of HTTP, whereas the uh, XML files are generated in the model, by the model. And you can manipulate them if you, sometimes if one, people use the command line version, they manipulate the XML files as well, but that's more than on the advanced level. Okay, uh, well, does anyone want to know the real parameters for HVV land? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Would be scary if nobody said yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, let's see how... Here we have... These are the real values. They come from the... So... And as you see, if you compare these values to those which you achieved, even the one, the winning model, they were not really the same. Uh, so again, kind of identify. You got a very good fit, even with. I think your. Uh, what did you have? The. Uh, you had an F. The threshold temperature of minus 11, minus 0.8. So it, uh, your TP check was different. So all the parameters were somewhat different, but still, we got fed. Is it the only parameter set that uh, have the zero mesh oh, the, the, the one. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So numerically, this is this is the set. This is the real, the reality. Um, I'm not sure whether there might now. I, I don't think. Any other parameter set might be very good and you get close to one, but not perfectly. With this one, you should get a perfect fit of 1.0. Uh, and if you use these values, then what you can do then is uh, just change one parameter at a time, and then you the two lines. So if you put in these parameters, you run the model, the two lines should match perfectly. And then you, by changing one or two parameters, you can see the effect of the parameter change very clearly by the difference between the two lines. So basically, similar to the, the, the plot I showed for, for, the, for beta and FC during the lecture earlier, you can generate these plots by your own now by changing parameters and then seeing when and where they, they, these parameter changes have an effect. But don't put that on the internet. It's top secret. <laughs> there was also a question about the model <coughs> equations. Partly they are given in the help file, and also a recommendation is the, this publication uh, uh, which we had in, in HES, Hot uh, Logic and Earth Science Systems, uh, in 2012 about the HV model, it's called something Teaching Biological Modeling. Um, and the link hopefully should be on the slides included. Um, in this paper, we describe also, we list all the equations being used in the HV model. So if you want to have the exact equations, they can find them there. 